Hey, thanks once again to the band for a great time of worship. Really appreciate it all. And welcome to Groton Bible Chapel. Glad that you're here and know that you have a lot of choices on Sunday morning. Thanks for being with us here and in person, downstairs in the overflow and online. We want to welcome all of the GBC family members in this morning. And we started our new study on the book of Esther last week. And using the tagline about Esther, the book of Esther, it's the providence of God. Last week we expanded that idea of providence, and providence means to provide. And we spoke about the fact that God is always providing and directing the universe. He's moving us into tomorrow. He's directing us into the future of His providence, of His care, because God will provide. And this week I had a unique reminder of this concept. So, my wife and I, we, each, we have two cars, and her car is an older uh, Toyota Corolla, 2001, almost 190,000 miles. It's a go-kart, but it gets 41 miles to the gallon, so we like it. So a couple of weeks ago, we needed to switch cars. I have a larger car. She has the go-kart. We switch cars, and so I was taking her car down, uh, down Interstate 95 toward East Lyme. So I get the car up to speed, which of course, as we all know, is 65 miles an hour on the highway, and the car starts to shake. The wheel shakes. Like any good home mechanic, I think, ah, if I go faster, I bet this goes away. <laughs> so sure enough, as soon as I get up toward around 75, smooths right out, 80, no problem. So I get home and I say, honey, is there something wrong with your car? Oh well, yeah, it's, it shakes, it does that, you know, it smooths out eventually. I know that. <laughs> yes, it does, it smooths out eventually. But I'm thinking to myself, something wrong with this car. So I made an appointment with my mechanic, and the, the, the appointment was this past Monday. But Friday, before Monday, my wife calls me, and she's gone, of all places, to Providence. And on her way home from Providence, she notices that she got off an exit, and when she turns the wheel, the car's not really going where the wheel goes. That's not good. So, yes, don't drive. Call AAA. We'll have it towed to our mechanic. We have it towed to our mechanic, and he put it up on the lift, and this is what he saw. This is not good. This is the subframe at the bottom of the car. What had happened is that the entire steering assembly broke loose and the frame is all rotted. As a matter of fact, when it went up on the lift, it kind of did this. <laughs> to the point where the doors won't even close anymore because the car's out of square. Now, if you want to understand the providence of God and watching over all things, my reaction is, thank heavens that my wife pulled over and in the providence of God, on her way home from providence, <laughs> right, you can't make this up. She pulls over and she's safe and sound. And then two weeks earlier when I'm checking the car out at hyperspeed, it didn't blow up and go in separate directions. You see, God is directing. Even when bad things happen, God's not asleep. That's what providence is. And so when we go through the book of Esther, we have to understand that God is involved in all the stuff that happens, especially in today's chapter. So as, let's, let's pray together. Let's read Esther chapter 2, and see what it is that God wants to show us about himself today. Lord, thank you for letting us be in this place. In Christ alone we place our hope. Would you help us today as we look at the book of Esther and as we apply it to our own lives, Lord? Let us see not only the story that happened thousand years ago, but how we can be changed in our own lives by what we learn today. We pray in your name. Amen. Esther chapter 2 Verse 1, later, when the anger of King Xerxes has subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the city of, a citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. And let beauty treatments be given to them. And then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, 
and he followed it. I can hardly believe this is even in the Bible, right? This chapter starts later after all these things. And just to remind you, last week, in a drunken show of power, King Xerxes has this giant party and brings all his people together. And then he has a degrading request for his wife, Vashti, to come and display herself in front of all these people, all these men. She refuses. She's deposed, probably executed. And later, after all these things, includes that. But it also includes the battles that Xerxes waged on Greece. And let's just look at the map for a minute. Because Persia is over here. Our, our city of Susa is right around over in here. But Xerxes masses all of his armies and navies, and he goes around and comes down here. And up in this area right here is where the, the famous Battle of the 300 take place, the Battle of Thermopylae. You, many of you have seen that movie and how the 300 Spartans hold off the, the, uh, the armies of Persia. Well, that's a true story. True story. And Leonidas was betrayed and... And, and the Persians did win that battle, but later on they came down here to the Battle of Salamis, which is not the Battle of Salamis, as somebody uh, reminded me today. And down here, another, a huge battle took place, and Xerxes' entire navy and his army was defeated. Now, they were outnumbered more than 10 to 1, the Greeks were, and the Greeks won this war. They sent Xerxes and what was left of his army packing back into Persia, and three years later, after this huge, humiliating defeat, we pick up the story in Esther chapter 2. You see, because even though, even though Xerxes was mighty in power, and he was the most mighty person on earth at this time, God was humbling him. And God was working through the history of time. And we are about to see the power in, in the world go from Persia to, the, to Greece. And in the story, after all this battle, after these giant losses took place, Scripture tells us that Xerxes remembered Vashti. He remembered his wife. He, maybe he was thinking about the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be changed, and he banished his wife, probably had her murdered. He set aside this woman he can never have again. He had a harem full of women, hundreds of women, at his beck and call, and yet he missed and wanted a wife. He missed and wanted a queen. Maybe he was in pain over a bad decision and listening to bad advice, and we will see it again and again and again in the book of Esther, where Xerxes falls prey to bad advice. He's a polygamist. He's a pagan. He has a large harem of women, but he wants one queen. And his personal attendants make a suggestion. These are the attendants that are closest to Xerxes. They, they suggest that he conduct a sort of beauty contest. And that the entire kingdom and all the provinces be involved. And that the governors get the most beautiful young women, young virgins, and bring them to the, to the palace. Hundreds of young women were conscripted against their will and made to be part of the royal harem. We kind of recoil at this thought, don't we? Uh, at least I do. You know, let, let's go out and round up all the beautiful women and, and turn them into a harem. Well, have you seen or heard of this show? <laughs> now, I'm not going to judge you if you watch The Bachelor, but I'm really judging you if you watch The Bachelor. <laughs> It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Oh, is this the week for the overnight date? Well, what do you think that means? For heaven's sakes, it's the same thing. Now, they're not being abducted to go on the show. Not that we know of. <laughs> but, you know, as a father of daughters, I think I would have hidden my girls. I think I would have, you know, put them in the cupboard or something when, when the king's men came in because I would hate to have them abducted. I would be brokenhearted if my daughters had been taken away to just go be another piece of the, of the harem for an unsatisfied ruler who worked his way through hundreds of women each year. You see, once they had been with the king, they belonged to him and they couldn't marry anyone else. They were legally his wives and harem. And if the king ignored them, they were destined for a life of loneliness. They went in as virgins and came out as concubines. 
never to go see the king again unless he remembered them and their name. Xerxes likes this advice of the, of the contest. He takes the advice and Haggai, the king's eunuch, is put in charge. Now we talked about eunuchs briefly back in, in Matthew. A eunuch is a surgically altered male so that they're incapable of sexual relations. You know, the Persians, it's said in history, captured and castrated four to 500 boys a year to place them into service. This was not a nice place to live. Haggai was the main harem eunuch. Now we go on. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah, was uh, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many of the girls were brought to the city of Sus- citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him, won his favor, and immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned her seven maids selected from the king's palace, moved her and her maids to the best part of the best place of, in the, of the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. So in the second section of chapter 2, we meet two new main characters, Mordecai, the older cousin who cared for Esther as his daughter, Esther the orphan who was lovely in form and feature, whose name Hadassah means myrtle, beautiful, fragrant tree, and her Persian name Esther means star. We get a little family history here, and we find out that it was Kish, Mordecai's great-grandfather, who went into captivity with Jehoiachin. This probably means that Mordecai and Esther were descendants of the leading citizens in, in Jerusalem and might in fact have been nobility. You know, the sad thing is they're passing themselves off as Persians. They've adopted Persian names. It appears to be total immersion in the culture because if they were, if they were practicing their faith, they would have stood out like a sore thumb, but they did not. You know, and the same is true of us. Sometimes when we get out of the will of God, we adopt and adapt to look just like our surroundings, almost chameleon-like. No one knows that we're followers of Jesus because we don't live like it. We don't act like it, and we certainly don't tell anyone. That's exactly what they did. But you see, God's power is still at work with these people who weren't living the way God's children should live. It is clear as we go through this book that Esther cooperated in practices that were contrary to the Mosaic law. This would include having sex with a man not her husband according to the monogamous Jewish law, marrying a pagan, and eating unclean food. Esther does not follow the more Daniel-like example where Daniel stood apart from the culture, where Daniel prayed openly, and Daniel in the Babylonian culture was a man who was valued and was revered, and part of that was for his faith. You know, and as, as we read this book of Esther and we see the sin of people that takes place, God is still at work and he's accomplishing his purposes despite the way they were living. You see, God's narrative really withholds his reaction to what's happening. And he's certainly not the author of their sin, but he's working through it. And even though Mordecai and Esther had forgotten who they were and hidden who they were, God had not forgotten who they were. It's an enormous, an enormous comfort to us that God always sees us. So the king's order goes out and Esther is taken and added to this harem of virgins. And we read that Haggai was pleased by Esther. 
she found favor with Esther. And God is so great that He can be working right in the middle of this pagan harem and the keeper of the harem himself, who was a Gentile. His job was to provide pleasure for the king. He didn't know the true God of Israel. And nevertheless, Haggai plays an important role in our story. You see, even today, God is working in places and with people where we don't know and where we think God is absent. We look at that particular place and say, that's a God-forsaken place. You know, if you want to feel that way, you should go on the next Haiti trip. Because when you go there, you say, this place is such a mess. It's been a mess for hundreds of years. And you know what? God is at work there. God is at work there, and lives are being changed, and people are living with the joy of the Lord. It is not a God-forsaken place. We just look at it differently. This eunuch was pleased by Esther. Haggai was pleased. Remember, Haggai's a eunuch. He's not capable of a sexual relationship. So the fact that he gained, uh, was, was so pleased with Esther had nothing to do with sensuality, but with personality. Haggai saw something much deeper than beauty in Esther. Maybe it was her interactions with the other beauty contestants. Maybe it was her character, her winsomeness. Maybe she supported and helped the other girls. Whatever it was, she was different, and it was rewarded. And the verb is active when it says she gained his, his, uh, his favor. It's because she was doing things. It wasn't that she was just sitting back and being this beautiful girl in the corner. She was active, and she was working, and maybe it was her attitude of humbleness or thankfulness or her social graces or her manners, whatever it was, she stood out. She got a special food, special diet, and servants. She got the best place in the house because of who she was. Let's continue on. Before a girl's turn came to go to King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there in the morning, return to another part of the harem to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. See, they're no longer virgins anymore, now they're concubines with somebody else in charge. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. By the way, this is four years after chapter one. Okay, time is passing. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other woman, women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. I hate the way this section starts. Before a girl's turn. Her turn? The king evidently had sexual relations with a different virgin every night whenever he pleased. The women in the harem used their time to become as attractive as possible. Xerxes was known throughout the kingdom and in others for his practices in this area. If Persia valued beauty and sensuality. It's actually worse than The Bachelor or the next top model. Bathes in spices, perfumes. It's a spa treatment for a year before you're ready to go in to take your turn. Both Josephus and Jewish rabbis in history talk about the beauty of Esther. The rabbis held that Esther was one of the four most beautiful women in the history, in their history, along with Sarah, Rahab, and Abigail. Josephus, the historian, 
maintained that Esther surpassed all women in beauty in the entire habitable world. That man got around. How else would you know? Each night a new maiden was brought into the king, and in the morning she sent to the house of the concubines, never to return again. After that night with the king, these young women stayed in with the other concubines where they would live for the rest of their lives. The king might call for them again, or he might never. And that was the life that they had until they died. You know, Xerxes was a man of unbridled sensuality and sexuality. He was probably unable to distinguish one person from another. It wasn't love. It was faceless, anonymous, insatiable lust. The more he indulged, it seems the less he was satisfied. Isn't it great that God views women with purity when men view women with just sensuality? Esther, when it was her turn, asked for nothing special. No jewels, no clothing, no nothing. Just, Haggai, you know the king. Give me what I need. She was humble and cooperative. She, she won the favor of everyone that she met. He goes, she goes in to see Xerxes, and he responds to her with greater enthusiasm than any other woman. At last, he had found someone to replace Vashti. The NIV says, as we've read, the king was attracted to Esther more than any other woman. And I want to suggest that this response was from the Lord, who wanted Esther in the royal palace where she could intercede for her people, as we'll see as the rest of the story unfolds. And Xerxes falls for Esther in a way that he, he'd never seen in anyone else. She moved him to desire her as queen over all the rest. The word that's used, winning his favor and approval, means kindness and close kinship. It was a deep connection beyond sexuality. But let's not, let's not misunderstand, as, as my good friend Dr. Dave said, now what do you think they did all night? Play chess? I don't think so. No, she went in for her turn. But it was not adultery because as this was a polygamous society and she was one of his wives under Persian law. The king personally crowns Esther, names her the new queen, and then he does what Xerxes does. Xerxes does. He has a giant party. Somebody after last week's sermon texted me that she thought a good name for Xerxes was Jerxes based on the way that, that he, uh, he comports himself. I thought that was pretty good. He uses every opportunity to celebrate. Let's go on to the last section. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. By the way, if you're going to have door guards, Bigthana is a great name. <laughs> Bigthana, guard the door. Yeah, that's the guy you want, right? But he's, he and, and this other guy decide they're going to kill Xerxes. Mordecai finds out about the plot, told King Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. When the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged in the gallows. All of this was recorded in the book of the annals, the presence of the king. This second gathering of the virgins has a has as commentators thinking it's a variety of things. Maybe these were leftovers from the beauty contestants. Maybe they were being sent home at the time. But regardless, we see that Mordecai is in a position of honor and authority, and he's at the gate. And sitting at the king's gate is kind of like working in the court system. It's where people of power and authority made decisions at a lower level than from the king. From, and here is Mordecai's at the at the east gate, and Esther becomes queen, and I wonder about this. Esther becomes queen, the next thing we know, Mordecai's a judge outside, so maybe, you know, maybe her family was also elevated. But here's Mordecai. He's now in a position where, in God's providence, he's allowed to hear a murder plot for Xerxes. 
and I did mention last week that Xerxes is murdered later on in history, um, and that's, that's how he came to his demise. Mordecai hears Teresh and Big Thana come up with this plan. He listens to it, and he tells Esther, and Esther tells the king. She gives credit for, to Mordecai for uncovering the conspiracy, and all of this is recorded in this, in this log. It's like the king's log, and the kings would have this read back at different times, and evidently, uh, kings would like to hear back the things of their kingdom, and it's, you know, it would be read back to them at different times, and we'll see that come up uh, in, in the future. It's kind of ironic that a captive Jew would save a Persian king. And these men, Big Thana and Teresh, had access. And so this, this uh, plot was caught right away. Mordecai, at this time, neither uh, receives recognition or reward for saving the king's life. You know, it was, it was known in history that rulers would absolutely be very generous to... Uh, to people who did such as what Mordecai has done, but here it seems to be entirely forgotten. And the story goes on and the the, uh, plotters are hung and killed. Mordecai is overlooked. But see, God by his providence is directing this entire affair. You ever feel overlooked? You ever do the right thing and no one gives you credit? Sometimes we feel exactly like Mordecai must have felt. Wait a minute, I just saved his life. And no one says a word. How can that happen to me? But see, even though Mordecai didn't receive a reward at this time, God sees and he rewards righteousness. He did then and he does now. Chapter 2 comes to an end with the hanging and the recording into the book of records. So let's get practical as we, as we tie up this chapter. First, I want to suggest we should correct bad life decisions. You know, Vashti was banished because she refused to come in and display herself in front of a bunch of drunken men. And Xerxes goes ahead and makes this law and banishes her and probably has her murdered. It's a bad decision. He's regretting it at the beginning of this chapter. You know, I regret bad decisions that I've made. The next question is, what do I do about them? Those things that involve people, do we go and clean it up? Do we seek forgiveness? Do we offer forgiveness? Do we say we're sorry to people when we make mistakes? Or do we just keep covering it up and have all of this stuff buried in our relational lives? We need to change that. We need to correct bad life decisions. Number two, don't hide or be ashamed of your faith. You know, Mordecai and Esther were so immersed in the culture, no one knew they were God's chosen people. Does anybody know you're a follower of Christ? Now, I'm not suggesting that you put the biggest bumper sticker on your car or biggest fish on the back of your car. I'm not suggesting that when somebody says, good morning to you, you say, good morning to you, Jesus loves you and so do I, and, and you know, unless it's appropriate. It's how our lives speak to people. You know, it's, it's, we, get, we get the ability to say something to someone about the Lord when we've earned that with our lives and living our lives and when, when our talk and our walk line up. Don't be ashamed of your faith. Third, God can use our attributes and attitudes to accomplish His purposes. You know, who you are is who you are on purpose. God made you that way. And God can use who you are and your attributes and your attitudes for his purpose. It's not all about a beautiful girl. We don't have to all be beautiful or handsome to be used. That's not what the story is teaching us. The story is teaching us that God wants to use all of who you are and all of what you do for his purpose. Are you available to be used? Do you understand that God in his providence wants to work in your life and through your life? Because God's got a plan. And lastly, God's providence is always at work. You know, sometimes I'm just too stupid to see what God is doing. But you know, when I stood under that car and I looked at that rusted piece of junk that used to be my wife's car, I was so thankful that God's angels were holding that thing together when she was driving home from Providence. You see, God is always at work 
Do you see that today? How will you live today because you know that God is working in your life and directing your life? Next week in chapter 3, we'll see a new phase with Mordecai. This is a great story. See you next week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the second chapter of Esther. Thank you that you're working in our lives today just like you were working in Esther and Mordecai's life. Lord, would you help us to be available for your service today, we pray in your name. Amen.